You too, thank you. Whenever you have like 48 hours to take it. And if something comes up, let me know. I can always reopen it for you. Mm -hmm.
see your grade? Yes. Yeah, you should be. You should be happy. I'm very happy. I I thought you would be. So.
There we go. Everybody should see that now. It'd be nice if I turn myself on. That would be good. Okay. So everybody should see the slide. It says sustenticular cells um, about the blood testes barrier. So uh, the, um, we have a series of supporting cells in the testes that surround the seminiferous tubules or are embedded in the seminiferous tubules. The cells look something like this. You have the uh, wall of the testes, I'm sorry, the wall of the seminiferous tubule. And within the tubule, you have uh, spermatogonia, the sperm producing cells. Um, the, sper the spermatogonia uh, are, are the stem cells and they are going to produce um, the uh, primary spermatocytes, which will become secondary spermatocytes, eventually become spermatids. The Sertoli cells, these great big structures here, are going to be the supporting cells to hold all these uh, other cells together. Furthermore, these Sertoli cells, why am I? There we go. The Sertoli cells help to maintain a blood barrier here, a blood testes barrier, because the, the problem with um, sperm cells is that they have antigens on the surface of their, of their cells that the white blood cells, the infection fighting cells have never seen. So they would turn the, the sperm cells as they were to get out into the normal blood supply would activate the immune system or be an immune response attacking the sperm cells because their antigens weren't there 12 years earlier or 10 years earlier or whenever um, you know, at puberty, whenever puberty started and sperm cells start being produced, those are brand new cells. When the immune system uh, became immunocompetent, the T cells that form the white blood cells that go into the thymus are trained to identify every antigen on every cell in the male's body. Well, sperm cells weren't there uh, in, the, in the first year of life. All these T cells, these white blood cells, learn to become uh, recognized foreign antigens in that very first year. So they don't, they would see sperm cells as foreign. So we have to keep them separate from the blood supply. We have to keep them away from the, the white blood cells, the infection fighters. And so the Sertoli cells that uh, form the, the, help to form the internal framework of the seminiferous tubules form a barrier the blood testes barrier. It keeps the antigens, the, uh, the sperm cell antigens from leaving the testes and getting into the blood supply. It prevents white blood cells from getting into uh, where the sperm are forming. So, yeah, let's, uh, okay. Okay, now let's, uh, where did she go? Well, I'll just go back to where I was. Okay, now. Let's move on. The male penis, the external genitalia on the male. It is, we refer to it as a copulatory organ because this intercourse is known as copulation. Uh, the role of the penis is to design to deliver sperm into the female reproductive tract. Uh, the penis has a lens, a tip on the end of it. Uh, the tip is made from the corpus spongiosum. That is that erectile tissue layer um, that um, surrounds the uh, urethra. The prepuce, the foreskin, is the skin covering the glands. 
uh, that can be pulled back or removed through circumcision. The uh, circumcision is simply uh, you know, surgically it is a snipping away of this skin because normally a, a an uncircumcised penis uh, has, the tissue comes down and covers over. It doesn't close off the opening to the urethra. You have, uh, but it just comes down around it. Uh, male has generally has to pull that tissue back when they urinate. They have to pull that tissue back to keep the urethra clean. So, and it looks something like this. This is what uh, an uncircumcised penis looks like with the foreskin covering the the glands. Here we see that uh, what the actual removal of the um, foreskin. It's a very brief and quick operation, usually done very early in, in the male's life. And then you end up with that ring shaped structure there where the glands was removed. Uh, and so it, it's about 30% of males now are circumcised for, for you know, whatever reason. Let's, uh, okay, now. About 30% of males are circumcised these days. So, yeah, it, um, you know, there's no real reason uh, other than uh, convenience in, in keeping the, the end of the penis clean uh, for circumcision. Lots of males, you know, lots of males are not circumcised. Uh, and about 30 to 35% are. Now inside of the uh, penis, you have three sets of what we call the erectile tissue. This is the area, that, this is what causes the erection to occur. Uh, you have the urethra in the middle of the penis that carries the urine and as well as the semen and sperm during ejaculation. It is surrounded by one of the, the uh, erectile tissue bodies that's surrounded by the corpus spongiosum, which really describes what the tissue looks like. It's like, it looks like a sponge. You know, it, it just is it's like this cavernous, this, this hollow structure with lots and lots of um, uh, tissues in here that will expand as blood comes into it. And so the, the corpus spongiosum surrounds the urethra. The whole purpose of the corpus spongiosum is to protect the urethra during intercourse so that the urethra doesn't get bent and block the release of semen and sperm. On the dorsal surface, the top surface of the penis, you have two layers, two bands uh, uh, called the corpora cavernosum, two large bands. These are responsible for creating the erection proper. The spongiosum is designed to protect the uh, urethra. Now, the process of erection is a parasympathetic response. Parasympathetic nervous system. Remember, you have a, in the autonomic nervous system, you have both the uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic is your fight or flight um, system, and the parasympathetic is your rest and digest and defecate. Most of our time in our bodies is spent, uh, whether we're male or female, most of our time is spent with the parasympathetic as the dominant side. It's only the sympathetic only gets excited when we go into a, 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 a short-term stress situation. The, neuro, the, neuro, the neurotransmitter of choice for the parasympathetic side is always acetylcholine for uh, the sympathetic side is going to be epinephrine. So what will happen? Parasympathetic nervous system becomes stimulated. What it causes to occur is that it will cause blood flow in, to increase going into the uh, erectile tissue, the cavernosum and the spongiosum. We will see more blood coming in here and the penis, which is normally in a flaccid state, as the blood flows in, as, the, as we see dilation of the arterioles, the little tiny uh, arteries that lead into the uh, penis, we'll see more blood coming in. And the venules that drain the penis will be compressed. More blood coming in fills up the spaces in, in, the, in the spongy tissue. And then the spongy tissue presses down against the veins. 
and, blo and blocks the flow. And so blood becomes trapped in the spongy tissue. This is what causes the erection to occur. So we have more blood coming in than going out. We're preventing the blood from going out. So the terms tumescence and detumescence from flaccid to erect and erect to flaccid. Now, there's a term that comes into play here that we hear more of. It's called priapism. This is where you, you see the ads on TV that say, um, contact uh, your doctor if you have an erection that lasts longer than four hours. You know, uh, that is what we refer to as an abnormal uh, erection. The uh, you know, penis should not become, become erect and stay erect for, for more than four hours. Uh, this is usually, uh, usually occurs now if an individual takes too many of erectile dysfunction drugs, because obviously if some is good, more is better, right? We all know that's not true, but some people believe that. Okay. This is what the penis looks like in cross section. The cavernosums, two uh, cavernosums there uh, are on the dorsal surface. They run the length of the urethra uh, of the penis. The spongiosum surrounds the urethra. These are the erectile tissue that are going to uh, fill up with blood. Blood comes in through these arterioles and fills up the spaces here. And as they do, they compress the veins that would be leaving. And so we, we trap more of this blood in the uh, spongy spaces of the cavernosum and of the spongiosum. Now this is a uh, more detailed drawing than the, the previous one. You can see the areas highlighted in blue here are on either side of the, the, of the, uh, of the shaft are the uh, cavernosums. And if we look at the cross section down at the bottom there, you can see uh, the spongiosum surrounding the urethra. So the, um, all that erectile tissue there will fill up with blood uh, as, because you know, the male's excited, the male is sexually aroused, the parasympathetic nervous system is controlling this. And so we're increasing blood flow to uh, the, uh, the, the penis itself, the cavernosum and the spongiosum are getting more blood. Um, the, uh, we're seeing more blood go to the uh, penis itself. Uh, so uh, during sexual arousal, uh, we'll talk about what happens in the female shortly. Uh, when she goes through her sexual arousal stage. But as this blood flow increases, it fills up the spongy tissue, presses against the veins, and so more blood becomes trapped. If we don't compress those veins, then no erection occurs. No erection develops. This is the whole basis of erectile dysfunction in, in an individual. The, the blood flow coming in is not sufficient to compress the veins uh, and restrict flow so that an erection can occur. So the male sexual response is controlled through both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system actually works against uh, the male developing an erection, and the parasympathetic one is the one that leads to an erection. So normally in the male, the arterioles that control blood flow to the penis are constricted. Normally the male, uh, the arterioles, the arterioles are the smallest of the arteries. The arterioles are what we use to distribute blood throughout uh, the body, okay? Uh, they're normally in a, what we call a vasoconstricted state where they are squeezed. They're, they're small, they have small diameter. When the male becomes sexually aroused, it's, it's um, the central nervous system um, will activate the parasympathetic neurons. Remember we have central nervous system, we have the autonomic system that uh, does things automatically 
and we have both the sympathetic and parasympathetic. I just said that uh, the parasympathetic nervous system, when it becomes activated, will cause those uh, arterioles to dilate. It releases nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a very powerful vasodilator, meaning it causes the smooth nitric oxide causes those smooth muscles around the arterioles to relax. A, a blood vessel is constricted, it's narrowed. If the smooth muscle that surrounds the blood vessel is in, is constricted, is, is contracted. If the smooth muscle is contracted, the opening is tiny. We say the blood vessel is vasoconstricted. But if we release nitric oxide, nitric oxide causes that smooth muscle to relax and it dilates, it expands, it opens up. So we refer to nitric oxide as a vasodilator. It's, you know, you ever hear of someone who's having a heart attack, I mean, I'm sorry, someone who has chest pains and they pop a, a tablet of nitroglycerin and we ever, you, you know, I'm sure you've heard about it, right? Nitroglycerin, um, nitroglycerin uh, dissolves and forms nitric oxide. Chest pain in the heart is caused by a narrowing of an, of, a, of an artery in the heart. So you simply take nitri nitroglycerin, becomes nitric oxide, and the vessels throughout your body vasodilate, not just the heart, but everywhere. Well, what happens in sexual arousal uh, is that this parasympathetic nervous system uh, causes the release of nitric oxide acetylcholine, and that allows the smooth muscles around the arterioles uh, in the penis to relax and increase blood flow. The, uh, the, the, art, the, art, the arterioles uh, increase their blood flow and they start uh, the increased blood going into the spongy tissue, compresses the veins that would drain it and that causes the erection to occur. So the driver uh, is gonna, for the most, for this male sexual response, is going to be the parasympathetic nervous system. So the male becomes sexually aroused, uh, thinking about sex, uh, becoming stimulated in some way or whatever. Uh, that will uh, the the central nervous system will respond by triggering the autonomic nervous system uh, parasympathetic side, causing dilation of the arterioles increasing the blood flow, or at least nitric oxide, uh, and its neurotransmitter is acetylcholine to do that, or at least nitric oxide, increasing the blood flow, and the penis becomes enlarged. We have an erection. And then we have tactile stimulation of the glands, uh, which activates the mechanoreceptors in the glands, which travels up the sensory neuron pathways uh, to the spinal cord, to the brain. And as we stimulate the glands more and more frequently and more vigorously, then that will lead to male orgasm. And then at that point, we switch into a sympathetic response. So it's mostly parasympathetic up until that point. So um, we find that during uh, puberty, um, Males tend to think about sex every seven seconds or so, because uh, we see here, you know, thoughts about sex are going to trigger the higher brain centers. The high, we're going to trigger the autonomic nervous system. But a, a, a pubescent male generally thinks about sex every seven seconds. So I don't know how they evaluated that. So, but, and there are studies that say that. That, that doesn't change much as the male ages, so for what it's worth. Anyway, so this is the, the male sexual response. You know, we, it, we, the parasympathetic system is active to reach this point. The sympathetic system is, is inhibited because the sympathetic system would be saying, hey, we don't want to dilate those arterioles. We don't want them to become important with blood. We want to keep them constricted. We don't want this to happen. But once the, um, we reach the point of uh, enough tactile stimulation, then we have an autonomic response then um, 
that triggers orgasm. And orgasm is what's going to cause uh, ejaculation to occur. So arterioles dilate, uh, the corpus corporate cavernosum expands, it fills with fills up with blood. The, uh, it compresses the veins so they can't drain. The erectile tissue enlarges and the penis becomes stiffened. Uh, it can be stopped by uh, emotions. It can be stopped by uh, higher mental activity. You know, it, uh, you know, a male can, can get an erection thinking about sex or can prevent an erection thinking about something else. Um, it, it happens. There's a lot of things that are going to bring this into play here. Um, now, the um, spongiosum keeps the urethra open. The penis itself has fibers of collagen. Collagen, the most abundant protein in the body. Uh, stronger than steel, what we find at our tendons, uh, attaching muscle to bone. We have rings of collagen surrounding the penis so that it won't, the penis itself won't bend. You know, uh, there are lots of trauma uh, cases were documented of an individual who has said, theoretically broken his penis. And it's been at a very uh, obtuse angle, it, it, it's damaged, but it doesn't break, but it still is, uh, I would imagine, a very extremely painful uh, event, because there's nothing that people can't do to themselves, just for what it's worth. Okay. A couple of things happen here as the penis becomes erect. The testes tend, and the scrotum tend to be, tend to be pulled up toward the abdominal wall. We will see a flushing of the glands as more and more blood uh, moves into the penis. You'll start seeing uh, uh, semen coming from the bulbourethral gland. That's the first semen that gets released. It's the first 5%. Uh, it's there to clean out the urethra and also clean the tip of the glands because of the presence of bacteria. And um, again, the sensitivity of the glands increases. Uh, and sexual arousal is about 10,000 times more sensitive to touch than any other portion of the body. Its counterpart is the clitoris in the female, which also will become aroused and engorged with blood and enlarged and just as sensitive. So now, I said all that already. Uh, nitric, I did, didn't mention that the nitric oxide well, also, uh, that, that's the trigger to stimulate the bulbourethral gland to release its five, the five semen, it's first, the first five percent of all the semen. So the key here for arousal is going to be the release of the nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a vasodilator. It's a vasodilator. Now, the, it doesn't just work at... Um, penis. When you release nitric oxide into the arterioles of the uh, blood supply leading to the penis, that nitric oxide is going to go everywhere. And so we have a enlargement, a dilation of many of the vessels in the body, many of the blood vessels, and, and that can become an issue. So uh, depending on whether or not the individual is healthy enough to have sex. The because uh, the nitric oxide doesn't know where to go, it just goes. It gets released initially in the arterioles uh, of the penis, but it goes into circulation. Just like a person who has chest pain and takes a nitroglycerin tablet, that nitroglycerin is not going to just go to their heart, it's going to go in circulation, it's going to go everywhere in the body, and it's going to act as a vasodilator in every vessel. And the same thing is happening with the nitric oxide that's getting released at the penis. Yes, it's going to open up those vessels and enlarge them and allow more flow to, blood flow to go through, but the nitric oxide is going to be in circulation. And so you're going to see, um, you're going to see a vasodilation of more vessels. Now, a, a male that is sexually aroused is going to see uh, a, a spike in the heart rate, 
a spike in blood pressure. And if they're, you know, and their heart and blood pressure, the heart rate and blood pressure are going to have to deal with this dilation of vessels. Now that's not a bad thing normally, because if a male is sexually aroused, he's using a lot of muscles and he's very active. And so we want to see increased blood flow to, to the muscles, for example, skeletal muscles. That's good. Increased blood flow to the heart. That's also good. But if we, if the heart is not healthy enough, then we have some issues. So now this, because now this, now this is where we get into erectile dysfunction drugs. Erectile dysfunction drugs um, work by um, allowing a male to achieve an erection that they normally can't have. We know that the parasympathetic nervous system triggers the release of nitric oxide. If a male has erectile dysfunction, for whatever reason, uh, then they generally release, they don't release enough nitric oxide. That's, that's the primary cause here. Not enough nitric oxide is being released. Without nitric oxide, you're not going to get enough of a vasodilation of the arterioles of the penis. You're not going to get more blood coming through here. So the male is, the male is sexually aroused, but he's not releasing nitric oxide. Blood going in is being matched by blood going out. No erection. A um, lot of causes. Age is one of them. Individuals over 40 years of age, half of all males over 40 tend to have some form of erectile dysfunction. Um, if, you, if your male has had a uh, patient has had prostate cancer and it's had surgery or radiation for prostate cancer, uh, they may have damaged the nerve net that sits on top of the urinary bladder, which are parasympathetic nerves that trigger the release, you know, that carry the signal to release nitric oxide. That happens too. So in the past 20 years, there have been a lot of drugs developed to, um, you know, uh, treat erectile dysfunction. You know, it's one of those that, uh, one of those conditions that had, you know, uh, that occur in lots of males, but nobody did anything about it. Well, about 20 years ago, uh, uh, Pfizer, was working on a new drug to improve uh, blood flow through the heart. Uh, they, were, had, they were looking at uh, ways to, to improve the, the diameter of the, uh, art, the uh, cardiac uh, blood supply and the coronary arteries. And they had this drug called sildenafil. And they were distributing out, you know, they had these blind uh, um, uh, studies, they had, uh, people that were that had uh, a placebo and people that had, uh, had uh, the actual drug. And so you had a control group and you had an experimental group and uh, they were looking for results. And apparently it didn't work that well to improve blood flow in the coronary arteries. And so at the end of the trials, they asked all the people involved to give back their medication. And none of the men did because one of the unknown side effects of sildenafil was that it increased the release of nitric oxide. Well, it's a systemic release throughout the body, but it also caused erections. Sildenafil increased the flow, increased the release of nitric oxide, or rather it inhibited the breakdown of nitric oxide. And sildenafil became Cialis, the little blue pill, if you will. Uh, that was the, the first of the erectile dysfunction drugs. Uh, what Cialis, what, uh, what, I'm sorry, not Cialis, but Viagra. What Viagra does is uh, as nitric oxide is being formed, it prevents the nitric oxide from being destroyed by enzymes uh, in the blood. So a patient that has erectile dysfunction takes a Viagra and it blocks the breakdown of the nitric oxide. The parasympathetic system says, release the nitric oxide, and instead of it being released and then destroyed, it stays there, allowing an erection to develop. The, um, 
there is an enzyme. The, what, it, what the erectile dysfunction drugs do, if you're really interested in here, the enzyme is called phosphodiesterase type 5 that breaks down nitric oxide. And um, the, yes. Um, isn't, isn't it just like any other drug and other people can, like if they overdose, they can die? Oh yeah, yeah. I've, uh, heard, I've heard of some cases it's like that. So I was just oh, like, lots I'm of males have died uh, during sex because, uh, you know, they've taken the erectile dysfunction drugs, they've taken Viagra, they've taken too many Viagra at one time because if some is good, more has to be better. Uh, we all know that. Uh, or their heart's not healthy enough for sex. You know, the early ads on TV never said anything about that. Uh, now, now they do. Now they do. You know, uh, because too many too many males were dying in, in the process because their heart wasn't healthy enough. You know, uh, some of those early ads were really obtuse. You know, one of them uh, showed a couple sitting in two separate bathtubs. You know. How do you make the connect? You know, just like, well, that's nice, but you know, they're sitting in the in two in two bathtubs looking at the sunset. Uh, I'm not making the connection, you know, and you know, I, I realize I can be dense, but I wasn't making. You know, I don't think anybody was making the connection. That the point is though that these drugs work by nitric oxide gets released, and an individual with erectile dysfunction. Uh, either doesn't have the receptor, enough receptors for the nitric oxide or the nitric oxide is being destroyed by this enzyme. Well, these erectile dysfunction drugs work by blocking that enzyme. So more blood can come out and press against the veins. The veins work fine. The arterioles work fine. They're just not getting enough. Uh, the nitric oxide is being destroyed before it can do its job. The problem with... Uh, uh, these drugs is that it is a systemic effect. It causes vasodilation everywhere. Well, and that's fine because that's what nitric oxide does. Um, but there are a lot of side effects. Headaches, number one complaint, uh, severe headaches because you're dilating blood vessels everywhere, including your brain. Nasal congestion, uh, your male patients will complain of a runny nose all the time because when you vasodilate, you increase uh, the release. You know, when you vasodilate, more plasma leaks out of the vessels and moves into the interstitial area and then is released as mucus. Back pain and muscle aches, you know. Part of that also is probably because they're using muscles they haven't used in a while. A lot of redness in the, in the face and flushing because you know, a, a, individuals when they're sexually aroused have a phenomenon known as a sexual flush as increased blood flow occurs. That's normal, but now we're dilating all the vessels in the male. Uh, and so you have increased flushing in here. Indigestion, acid reflux, because again, you're putting more mucus out, more plasma out and dizziness because you're dilating the vessels. You're reducing the blood flow going to their brain. We may see changes in vision. Male, one of the complaints about people that take uh, these ED drugs are they lose certain co uh, colors in the spectrum, particularly blue. And there have been some really bizarre stories of people that have uh, taken a Viagra and then tried to fly a plane. You know, not fly as a passion, but fly a plane and flew into the ground or flew into the water because they couldn't rec couldn't distinguish water and sky. Uh, it may affect hearing and it may cause an erection that lasts longer than four hours. So another problem that occurs, and this is very critical, you get a patient brought into the emergency department with chest pains and it's a male and you know, you're about ready to give them a nitroglycerin tablet and you have to ask them if they've taken an erectile dysfunction drug. Because what does an erectile dysfunction drug do? It allows you to retain more nitric oxide, that very powerful vasodilator that your body's releasing. What does nitroglycerin do? It releases nitric oxide. And so your patient who's having uh, a heart attack 
their blood pressure is dropping because they've taken the erectile dysfunction drug and are vasodilating everywhere. And now you give them a nitroglycerin tablet and you vasodilate them again. And now their blood pressure crashes. So you can't give them um, nitroglycerin on top of the, of the erectile dysfunction drug. And if they don't tell you the truth, then they run a risk. Yeah. So um, it happens. You know, lots of you know individuals get into trouble um, because they're afraid to say that they took an AD drug. When the uh, when the direction of that like be painful? Oh, I'm sure it would be. You know, uh, you know, it a four hour long erection. You know, that's. Yeah, there's some significant issues there, you know, um, you know, on how to get the erection to come down, you know, pack it nice, you know, surgically intervene, you know, suck out the extra blood. But yeah, it's, it, it, it's got to hurt. Just sounds I can't even comprehend what that would be like. The more significant issue, of course, is do you have a 60 year old male, for example, who has taken a, a, a Viagra or two, who um, hasn't had sex for 20 years, is not healthy enough to have sex. Their heart is weak. They have, start having chest pains and protocol would normally say, give them, a, uh, give them a nitroglycerin tablet. Or what if they have some nitroglycerin because they've already, or, you know, they're used to having chest pains. They have, um, angina so they pop their nitroglycerin tablet and then they collapse you know because their blood pressure has dropped drastically you know that there are issues you know like that that occur so it's a whole new uh consideration and treatment and uh, you 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 even get younger males that don't need to take these drugs they will take them because they believe it will enhance uh their sexual response, you know. And the problem is that if you if you have a patient who persists in taking um, Viagra when they don't need it, it may end up becoming to the point where they now have to take it because they can't sustain an erection any other way, so. Wouldn't, like, wouldn't a drug like that, couldn't it also weaken the heart? Oh yeah. Because of how like it causes that violation? Yeah, it, it uh, you know, it, on, on the occasional use of it, it's not a problem, you know. I mean, it's, it's no more than having a, you know, a, a healthy male has an erection and releases nitric oxide and the heart's fine with that because the heart's healthy and, you know, it's a muscle and it's, it's, it's used to this. Um, but constant use of this drug, particularly if the heart hasn't been, you know, the people that are taking this are usually individuals who haven't been able to achieve an erection for some time. Their heart's not as healthy, healthy, healthy as it could be. And so, yes, the heart, you know, uh, you get a 65 year old male, for example, who hasn't had sex in 20 years, who is suddenly rediscovering his teenage years, at least in his mind, uh, for what, it, because of this, this magic drug, uh, their heart's not prepared for that. You know, it's, it's just like an individual who says, I'm gonna start running. I'm gonna go out and start running every day, you know, and their body isn't prepared for it. You know? yeah. yeah, you know, we won't even go there in that one, but you know, so. okay. So after arousal, after each, uh, erection and stimulation of the glands, then that will lead ultimately to orgasm. Orgasm is a sympathetic response, and orgasm causes the uh, the it causes the ejaculation. The uh, the sphincter muscles at the bladder, the little ring of tissue, uh, muscle tissue there, will pinch off the bladder, pinch off the urethra, so no urine comes out. Uh, all the uh, semen and uh, will dump into the ejaculatory duct with the sperm. Uh, you'll see uh, these smooth muscles start contracting rapidly. Uh, semen gets ejaculated at 11 miles an hour. Somebody had to measure that, you know? Um, I, 
well, what did you get your degree in? Well, I measured the speed of semen. What did you do? You know, I don't know. But somebody had to measure it, you know, 500 centimeters per second, 11 miles an hour. Well, it's, it's caused by the rapid contractions of the smooth muscle because we have to get the semen and the sperm out. Now the sperm will swim, but they're not gonna swim out of the end of the penis and into the vagina. They're, they're gonna, the ejaculation throws them out and that's called the orgasm, the climax, uh, the, the male came, whatever. And you're gonna release about 400 million sperm in that semen. You'll have about three or four milliliters of semen and about 400 million sperm cells in there. And it, uh, so there are hundreds of million of sperm cells in the epididymis. One ejaculation is not going to uh, measurably reduce the amount of sperm cells. If there is no ejaculation uh, over any length of time, eventually the mature sperm cells degenerate because there's always more being produced ready to uh, uh, replace them in the epididymis. So, okay. What controls the production of um, these uh, sperm cells? Well, it is ultimately, it's the hypothalamus. You know, males don't start producing sperm until they hit puberty. Puberty can be anywhere from as early as nine or 10 to as late as 13 or 14. It just depends, everybody's different. And so, but ultimately it's the hypothalamus that controls the production of the sperm. The secondary, when male hits puberty, the secondary sex characteristics start uh, developing. That's initially triggered by the androgens from the adrenal cortex. Um, and we, see, we start seeing the, the, the testes become active in producing sperm, you know, facial hair, body hair, muscle enlargement bone growth, and all those other things that happen during the secondary sexual characteristics. So the hypothalamus plays a real role here though um, in controlling the sperm production. We, it is a, the hypothalamic uh, pituitary gonadal axis and it uses um, the, uh, the release of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone um, it's the production of testosterone and it's the production of inhibit. So the hypothalamus is always monitoring the levels of uh, testosterone in the male. If the levels of testosterone drop, then the hypothalamus will stimulate the, uh, the, the pituitary gland, the anterior pituitary to release um, luteinizing hormone. If testosterone drops, it will release luteinizing hormone. The anterior pituitary releases luteinizing hormone. The hypothalamus uses those gonadotropin releasing hormones and says, okay, go make some luteinizing hormone. So the anterior pituitary makes luteinizing hormone, which acts on the interstitial cells in the seminiferous tubule, and they make testosterone. Testosterone levels go up and the hypothalamus says, okay, I'm fine. You know, our, our levels are normal. Uh, we also, at the same time, it will release follicle stimulating hormone because if we're going to release testosterone, we're going to release FSH2. Now, they're two separate hormones, but we're going to release FSH at the same time so that we make, we direct the production of more sperm cells. Males are going to make sperm cells from the onset of puberty to the day they die. It'll, you know, this is that endocrine control I was talking about that can last for 80 years. You know, and just because a male can produce viable sperm at 90 doesn't necessarily mean that he should become a father at 90, even though some do. You know, there are lots of males that become a father very late in life. Anyway, so we keep a track. The hypothalamus is always monitoring testosterone concentrations. Testosterone levels drop, more uh, luteinizing hormone, more FSH. Testosterone levels are high, less L luteinizing hormone, less FSH. You know, males always have more an abundance 
of sperm cells uh, being produced and stored in the epididymis. Okay, now, just said all this. Um, What does testosterone do to the male? Well, testosterone is made from cholesterol. Its structure is very similar to cholesterol. It's, you know, it's a steroid based hormone. It's got that same ring structure that cholesterol does. The difference between testosterone and estrogen is just a couple of functional groups, uh, the rearrangement of some functional groups, and that's all. Testosterone triggers sperm production. It, le it, will, um, it is the driver for the male's libido, the sex drive. It also uh, it, uh, controls the secondary sex characteristics. As testosterone gets released during puberty, uh, you'll see the male develop pubic hair, axillary hair under the armpits, and facial hair. It will, you'll see the enlargement of the chest, uh, the change in the structure of the vocal cords, so the voice deepens, uh, bones will get uh, more dense and grow, uh, muscles will become enlarged, uh, they won't, you won't grow new muscle cells, but you will, uh, they will get bigger, they will enlarge. Uh, all these are driven by the presence of testosterone. Okay, so testosterone is the driver for all that. We start producing testosterone in large quantities at puberty. The androgens that get released from the uh, zona reticularis of the uh, cortex, those androgens in the male are essentially testosterone. And so those are, when that, when that is being released at high enough quantities, that's usually the trigger to start the onset of uh, puberty. Now let's switch over to the female side and look at the reproductive systems in the female. The female reproductive system is much more complex. Uh, it has to be because not only will it produce uh, a gamete every month, but it will also, uh, if the gamete is, uh, uh, if the egg is fertilized, then it has to provide a place for the uh, egg to grow and deliver it. So the female, uh, the ovaries are going to be where the eggs are contained. Uh, the, every month, a gamete is, is brought to maturity, an egg is brought to maturity. We have estrogen and progesterone are the two sex hormones here in the female. <clears throat> we have um, a... Uh, very complex reproductive structure internally and externally we, because you have the uterus, the fallopian tubes, the vagina, the cervix, uh, the paired fallopian tubes are in indirect contact to the ovaries. The ovaries release an egg every month and they make their way into the uterine tube maybe and find their way down to the uterus where they might or might not implant. And then externally, we have the uh, um, labia major, labia minor, the clitoris at the top of the vestibule. Uh, we have the breasts to provide uh, nourishment for the developing baby. Uh, and then we have all these mucus glands for lubrication too. So it's a very complex system. That's what it looks like. Here we have the vagina. The vaginal orifice is right down here. At the top of the vagina is the uh, cervix, um, which is the connector between the, the vagina and the uterus. The uterus is about the size and shape of an inverted pear, where the uh, body of the uterus is this large portion uh, you know, coming up from the cervix. The, we call the, the area below this, I read it, the cervix called the isthmus leading into the body. Yeah. Do we need to be able to no, not for lecture. So um, we have the body of the, you have to just know what it is, where it is and stuff like that. But no, you don't, not for lecture. Okay. The curve is called the fundus. 
a lot of these terms get used again in other places. Isthmus shows up several times. Uh, the body, we use the body all over the place uh, in terms. Um, you know, I just introduced the body of the vertebrae to the AP1 uh, classes. So that's the first time they heard the term body. So the fundus is the top of the, of the pair. Remember, it's an upside, it's an inverted pair. And that's about the size and the shape of a uterus. Now coming off of each side of the uterus is the fallopian tube or uterine tube or oviduct. You know, uh, three different names now for it. Fallopian is old school, uterine and oviduct are newer terms. Um, you know, so you, most people are still going to call it the fallopian tube because that's what it's been called for a long, long time. Um, the ovaries are attached to the side of the uterus through uh, ligaments. In this case, the ligament um, is, can be the suspensory ligament or, and the broad lig ligament. There is no direct connection between the ovary and the uterus. Uh, the uterine tube reaches out to the ovary. It does not touch the ovary. The uterine tube ends in this finger-like structure that uh, creates a current to draw an egg into the uterine tube. So the what the uh, if the egg gets released but it does not make it into the tube, then the egg will degenerate. You know, it is entirely possible, though, for an egg to be fertilized outside the uh, uterine tube. Because anything is possible. You can have an ectopic pregnancy that would occur in the abdominal cavity. Probably have a greater chance of success than the one inside the uterine tube. So there's there's a you know all, all sorts of things can happen. So, but there, you know, basically there's no direct connection. We depend on the egg, you know, something that is the size of the pointy end of a pin drifting because it's only one cell drifting into the uterine tube, past the fimbriae, into the infundibulum, where, and it can, if, it get, if there's sperm present, it will get fertilized in the ampulla, and then it still has seven days to get itself down to the uterus and implant itself. Okay. We see here in this cross section, or actually this is a sagittal cut that we're looking at, but we can see that the uterus is tilted forward over top of the urinary bladder, uh, it looks like it's about a, uh, it makes a 90 degree bend from where the, um, the vagina comes up and then the cervix is tilt, uh, the cervix and the uterus are tilted 90 degrees sitting over top of the bladder. This does cause some di discomfort for the uh, female later in life during pregnancy because when you have the baby developing in the in uterus, in the uterus, you have the baby and the amniotic sac and all that fluid pressing down on the urinary bladder. So it creates a little bit of discomfort here because you got 30 pounds pressing on the bladder. Um, you also see um, the um, external genitalia there. You see the large uh, outer fold called the labia major. The inner fold is the labia minor. The clitoris, the um, counterpart to the glans penis is on the anterior, on, on the anterior side of the what we call the vestibule that's that area that surrounds the opening to the vagina and to the uh, urethra it's that area highlighted in, in blue over there uh, when the female becomes sexually aroused the clitoris will become enlarged and engorged with blood and its sensitivity level goes way up to match the glands probably ten thousand times more sensitive than uh, any other area in the female body. We see something similar taking place in the nipples. The nipples become enlarged and gorge with blood and become sensitive. Not quite as sensitive as the clitoris, but they are also uh, during sexual arousal. Uh, we see lots of glands around the vestibule to, to secrete mucus for lubrication. Um, we see uh, 
at least on here, we see one of the uh, ovaries with the uh, fallopian tube leading to it. And we can see its proximity of uh, the uterus and the vagina and the cervix to the rectum and to uh, uh, the urethra. And of course, I mentioned in lab, the issue here, uh, one of the reasons why your female patients will probably, will, will more likely have UTIs, urinary tract infections than your male patients is because the urethra is extremely short. It's like five centimeters in length. So you have the urethra uh, opening into the vestibule, you have the vagina opening into the vestibule, and then just posterior to the uh, vestibule, you have the opening to the, to the anus. So you have this very close, prox uh, very close proximity of three openings in a warm, dark, moist environment. It's very easy for bacteria to migrate back and forth, no matter how clean your patient uh, attempts to be, you know, there are many people that are very, very fastidious in, in their efforts to stay clean. It's never enough because bacteria doesn't care. And so bacteria can migrate uh, into the vestibule and find its way into the urinary tract through the urethra. And the problem is since it's a very short uh, urethra, it's challenging for the female's immune system to respond quickly before that bacteria makes it into the bladder. So your, your female patients are gonna be more prone to UTIs simply because of that. Okay, there are the ovaries. The ovaries on either side, they're about the size and shape of a grape held together, held uh, in place by ligaments. Um, they, um, are surrounded, you know, the, the uterine tubes overlap them with the fimbriae hanging down around them and the fimbriae will generate a current uh, to try and drag or draw the eggs into the fallopian tube. Now the court, the ovaries have an outer and an inner layer, a cortex and a medulla. There's a term we've heard before. And you're gonna hear that term again when we talk about other organs. The outer layer of the ovary contains the gametes. It contains the eggs, the immature eggs and the eggs that are becoming mature. Uh, and and um, the inner portion of the ovary is where we have our blood supply. The uh, ovaries are supplied by the ovarian arteries and the ovaries um, have um, ligaments attaching them in place and they have a layer of uh, connective tissue with the same name that we had in the, in the, in the testes, the tunica albuginea, and um, which divides up the um, ovary into regions. Now, it is thought, it, it's always been conventional wisdom that when, if you are a female, you are born of all the eggs you're ever gonna have, somewhere in the neighborhood of several hundred thousand, um, and uh, at puberty, uh, you know, lots of numbers have been kicked around. Some say a million eggs at birth and several hundred thousand at puberty. Uh, it doesn't really matter because during, uh, during the female's reproductive uh, lifespan, uh, uh, when she's fertile for 30 or 40 years, she's gonna release about five or 600 eggs over that time. And it's always been conventional wisdom that you're born with what all the eggs you're ever gonna have, but it may be that the epithelial layers that surround the ovary may be producing new eggs. We don't know yet, but that's where, that's where a lot of research is going right now that maybe we are producing new eggs. The concern is that if you have a 40 year old female for your patient, and she has become pregnant for her first time or her fifth time, it doesn't matter. Did she get pregnant with a 40 year old egg? Because a 40 year old egg is an old egg and it's got, it's wearing out and it may have problems with its DNA. It may have uh, breaks in the DNA. Or, and she may be at higher risk for some sort of birth defect with the baby. That's the conventional thinking. Uh, are you going to have a child with Down syndrome? Or are you going to have some of the more 
uh, unusual uh, complications because, of, because it's an old egg, or is everything going to be just fine? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the statistics. You know, I don't know how many 40 year old women have babies. I don't know how many of them have babies that have Down syndrome. You know, are the, are the statistics the same for them as a 20 year old female? Because if they are, then the argument that an old egg is more at risk than a young egg uh, is out the window. You know, don't know. But that's always been the conventional thinking is an old egg is more at risk. So anyway, the ovaries contain follicles. A follicle is a bubble. You know that, you remember that from the thyroid gland. The, the follicle in the thyroid contains thyroid hormone, but a, a, a follicle is a bubble. And in the follicle, you have an immature egg, we call it an oocyte. Now surrounding the follicle, you're gonna have follicle cells. Just, you know, we've heard that term before. You have follicle cells that surround the follicle. So you have a sac that contains one immature egg called the oocyte with follicle cells surrounding the sac. The follicles are going to change over time. They're going to grow. If you have what's known as the primordial follicle, you're going to have a single layer of cells plus the, plus the egg. So here is your follicle. Yeah, there's a plain ordinary circle. There's your follicle. The cells are on the edge of the follicle. Of the follicle. There's the follicle cells here, there is your oocyte right there, your immature egg, and you have one layer of cells. So we call this the primordial follicle, primordial follicle, plus the oocyte. If as this thing grows, you add more layers of cells, the cells are called the granulosa. cells. And so they're going to accumulate around the follicle. The granulosa cells will accumulate around the follicle. So right now, the, um, the immature egg in the follicle is a primordial follicle. That is the, the earliest version of the egg. As it matures, it can be called a, it goes through various stages and ends up being a um, tertiary follicle. So we have a primordial follicle and we end up when it's ready to be, be ovulated, we call it a tertiary or vesicular follicle. It's a very large mature follicle. So we go through a variety, several stages here to get from the primordial to the tertiary follicle. Now, ovulation is when we release the egg from the follicle. The follicle actually ruptures. The sac ruptures at ovulation and releases the egg. The follicle will rupture, release the egg, and the egg will then open deposited out in the abdominal cavity and has to make its way into the uterine tube. Maybe. No guarantees. There are no guarantees on anything here. Now, once the follicle ruptures, it becomes the corpus luteum. So we start out as a primordial follicle. The egg continues to mature and develop it ultimately becomes a tertiary follicle. And at that point, the egg is ready to be released through the process of ovulation. The follicle ruptures, releases the egg. The egg you know, is released in the abdominal cavity. It may drift into the uterine tube. And then the ruptured follicle becomes the corpus luteum. 
So this is what we see. There, you know, your primordial follicles are on the outside edge here, right along in here. These are all these little tiny things here are the primordial follicles. As they mature, they become a primary follicle. Then they become a secondary follicle. Then they become a tertiary follicle. When they're in the, we're in the tertiary stage, then they, in our, they enlarge and they rupture and the egg gets released. The oocyte stays inside the follicle. The follicle gets bigger and bigger as it grows. And then it, when it gets released, you know, the, the egg, when, when the follicle ruptures, the egg is released. This is an ongoing process inside the ovary. Okay. Now, problems in the ovary. We haven't had any problems for a while. Let's take a look at this. Ovarian cysts can occur. Uh, an ovarian cyst is like a bubble that takes place, that forms on the ovary. Um, it is, um, it's a sac that fills up with fluid. Um, and what usually it occurs if the ovary, if the follicle doesn't rupture and the egg doesn't get released, um, and you get, you know, these these follicles, they, they can happen all the time. Uh, your patient may not even know that she has an ovarian cyst. Uh, you, your typical cyst is usually only about a half an inch in size. Um, a, a simple cyst, you would only know it if you had an ultrasound. These simple ones usually don't cause any issues. Lots of people have cysts on different structures in their bodies. Most people have cysts on their kidneys and aren't aware of it. Uh, and these very small, simple cysts on, on the ovary will grow and large and then disappear. And then um, they go away and then you may have another one. It's only if they cause an issue, are you even aware that it, that it happened? So, so the follicle cyst, uh, okay, the simple cyst can be a half an inch. A follicular cyst um, occurs when, again, where you don't have ovulation and the cyst ends up, uh, the whole follicle collapses on itself and you get a cyst that's about three inches across. Uh, when, this, when this kind of cyst can rupture and when it does, it causes a great deal of pain. Okay, so you can, you know, this is bigger. The, the simple cyst is about a half an inch. You're not, probably not even aware of it. The follicular cyst can be three inches. When it ruptures, you're, it's a very sharp pain. The corpus luteum cyst forms after ovulation. The corpus luteum is the um, follic what's left of the follicle. It secretes progesterone. It determines when menstruation will start or not start. And so the corpus luteum, can form a cyst. And this can become um, uh, large. It can fill with, with uh, some sort of, you know, like water or it can blood. Uh, it may, it is usually uh, asymptomatic, meaning you're usually not aware you have this. The dermoid cyst shows up in younger females. Uh, generally grows to about six inches in size. This is the one that you've probably heard stories about that uh, have, may have bone, may have hair in it, um, may have fat in it. Uh, and this is the one that causes a great deal of pain because it can twist around the ovary and twist the fallopian tube and your patient has excruciating abdominal pain. Again, it's no fault of theirs. They did nothing wrong. They were not pregnant. It has nothing to do with pregnancy. It has everything to do with some, the, the cyst, uh, with a cyst forming in the ovary. Now there are other things that can occur here. Sometimes these dermoid cysts can become quite large. Here we see several examples of a huge dermoid cyst. On the left, you see a 93 pound ovarian cyst. Woman weighed 500 pounds. She went in for 
uh, gastric bypass and uh, weight loss surgery. And no one, what, what amazes me is no one ever took a look at her body mass to see what they were really gonna remove. They were gonna take off. Um, she was, she was, had to have surgery so she could go into gastric bypass. She weighed too much. And no one ever took a look at what you know, was fat or anything like that. They opened her up and the cyst weighed 93 pounds. She lost 137 pounds right after the surgery. She went from 500 to 350. Yeah, halfway to her goal. But that, you know, and you can see just how big the thing is there. Now that wasn't the record. The record was 328 pounds. That was in 1905. I'm surprised the patient survived. Actually, we don't say, they didn't say if the patient survived or not. Um, in 1954, there was a 184 pound cyst removed uh, and 198 pound cyst taken out in 1963 at Hopkins in Baltimore. So these things are massive or can be massive. They're unusual. You know, uh, I mean, look, look at the patient in the middle there. That's the patient that had the, the 93 pound ovarian cyst. Uh, they described it as a, like a big beach ball. You know, how did you not know that it was a cyst? Whatever. But, you know, she got, you know, she was halfway to her goal of getting her weight off because of this. Um, so th these are unusual. These are extremely unusual, but they do occur. So you, you, know, you can't just discount them, but they do occur, not very often. So, um, but again, a, an ovarian cyst occurs through no fault of your patient. That's an important thing to remember. It is, there's no blame assessment involved. It just happens. So, okay, now, ovulation. Many people, many women say they know when they ovulate. They know they can feel the pain of the, that there's a little bit of a sharp pain when the uh, follicle ruptures and the egg gets released. This is ovulation here. You can see there's the follicle, there's the egg coming out. Um, uh, middle schmerz is a term describing this little twinge of pain on the left side or the right side during ovulation. Some women can, can feel it, some can't. My wife can always tell me when she ovulates on her right side. Doesn't detect any on the left side, but on her right side, she can always tell uh, when she ovulates. And speaking of ovulation, there's no guarantee that the ovaries are going to alternate left, right, left, right. They can do what they, can do what they want to do. So, um, you know, they can alternate. They can all go, you know, <clears throat> six months from one side and three months from the other side, or they can just, one side may never function at all, but it just depends, you know, on what the ovaries are doing. The uterine tubes, the fallopian tubes, the oviducts, they're only about four inches long. And um, their role is to bring the, the egg to the uterus from the ovaries. They have nothing, to, you know, other than the, that um, fertilization takes place in the ampulla, Usually, they have nothing to do with uh, whether or not the egg's fertilized or not. They're going to transfer. They're going to move that egg uh, that gets ovulated from the ovary to the uterus in seven days. That's their role of, of the uterine tubes. Um, they are lined with cilia and they are lined with smooth muscle, and so the uh, the uh, Cilia are going to push the egg along, and the smooth muscle are going to squeeze and push the egg along, and it takes seven days to go four inches. And when it gets down to the uterus, it comes in near the near the uh, top of the near the near the fundus, uh, right between the fundus and the body. Um, it's called the um, the area is called the isthmus, and there's no guarantees that it's going to implant itself, even if it's fertilized it may not implant. Maybe, maybe it won't. Okay. This is what the uh, lining of the oviduct looks like with the cilia present. Cilia are gonna push 
and push and push in one direction. That's what their role is here. And again, this shows you the relationship of the uterus, the uh, uterine tubes and the ovaries are all very close together. That's only a four inch trip from the edge of the uterus to the uh, uh, beginning of the fallopian tubes here at the, at the ovary. And it takes seven days to get down there because ovulation day is always considered day 14 of the ovarian and uterine cycles. Because once, whatever day ovulation is, it could be the 13th, it could be the 16th, it could be the 15th, it doesn't matter. That becomes day 14 because 14 days later, menstruation will always start. And so that you're on a very short time frame here. You have seven days to get to the uterus. If it's a fertilized egg, it has to implant itself and, keep, and the uterine lining has to stay intact. If it doesn't get there, um, you're running up against a real time crunch. So and again, here's what everything looks like here. So now let's stop here. We will, today's Wednesday, we'll start up again on Monday at the uterus and move forward. Yes. Um, I think you said that we were going to discuss it later, but I think the first lab exam is going to start put on Monday. Are we still planning to do it on Monday or are we going to push it back? Again? I'll have to push it back because we didn't meet. You know, I mean, I went through, I, I, I made the lecture, put it, I posted it on YouTube, but I, you know, would probably like, as because we're going to move into the heart. Um, if we, if we had the test, I'd really like to move into the heart first and then give you some more time. We can talk about blood a little bit too. Okay. And also I have to talk to uh, Morristown to find out what I'm getting my hearts. Okay. So, so you're uh, no, I don't, I don't have it ready yet. Okay. You know, I don't want to spend 